Hello, this is Angela with Parkgrass Permaculture. I am back for another video talking about our poultry houses and why we think poultry are important in a permaculture system. So I'm in zone 8B here in Portland, Oregon, and we have one quarter acre, including the footprint of our house. So it's not that much land. We have a poultry permit for 12 birds here in Multnomah County. And that means that I can have a mixed flock of up to 12 birds, but nobody comes and checks on how many birds you actually have. I just wanted to be in compliance with the laws around here as much as possible and um, respect the fact that my neighbors probably don't want to put up with me raising a bunch of meat birds or something. So we also respect the fact that in our county, it's illegal to have roosters. It's not illegal to have drakes, which I talked about in my last video, but all of our chickens are hens. So I really love having chickens in an urban system. Obviously there are all of the problems like rodents in the city. Portland is notorious for having terrible rodent control. Um, and the fact that uh, chicken manure smells, the fact that chickens are a daily chore. You have to let them out, you have to feed them, you have to provide water, you have to provide enrichment for them, and you have to lock them up at night before things like raccoons in the city get to them. I don't obviously have issues with things like roaming dogs or foxes or um, actually I haven't had skunks be an issue either but the two big things that have been a problem for us have been raccoons. Um, my lovely neighbors kind of have some resident raccoons in their tree right over the fence and coyotes are prevalent in our part of Portland. I think they're prevalent all over Portland and we have quite a bit of fencing and I've never had a coyote in my yard, perhaps because we have two larger dogs, but um, all of our neighbors have had coyotes and I see coyotes regularly up and down my street. So I wanna make sure that I'm aware of those two urban predators that are gonna get to my chickens or try to get to my chickens and secure my girls as best as I can. Now I spoke in my last video about how I keep my ducks in a low profile duck house separate from my chickens. This is our chicken coop behind me. You can see it's quite tall. And we have had this coop for 13 years. When we first started gardening here, my eldest child, who's now 19, was insistent that we get poultry. That was the main thing she wanted. Mom, I want chickens. I want chickens, I want chickens, I want chickens. And so we got our permit as quickly as we could. We bought a coop off of Craigslist that came with free delivery and three one-year-old hens. It was owned by a high schooler who was going off to college and his folks did not want to take care of his chickens anymore. So we got it for just an absolute steal. Um, it was something that a teenager built and was covered in a uh, like chipboard and we knew that the siding was not going to last long but at that point in our lives we didn't have particularly good construction skills we didn't know anything about building anything we didn't have any tools and so we just bought something and said we're going to make this work until we acquire the skills to build something better 13 years later we still have the same coop we have resided it with seconds uh cedar siding from the rebuilding center i think we spent about $25 on siding to reside this coop. And that's okay. Originally it was painted blue and had a big sunburst on it that my friend Jenny came and painted. And that worked really, really well until the chipboard gave up the ghost. But this siding has been great. We've thought about painting it, but more and more, um, even though I originally liked that bold blue, I kind of like the naturalistic look of the cedar siding and let it kind of meld into the landscape. I'm going to put this girl down so I can show you around a little bit more. She would prefer to be held all day long. She would prefer to come in the house with us and she will probably run around pecking the back of my calves once I set her down, demanding to be picked up, but um, I'm going to set her down. So hang on. So now we've moved around the corner. I was standing right there and now I'm right here looking at the front of our coop. I saw a long time ago in a like kind of folky, maybe it was Country Living magazine, where somebody had used old number 10 can lids as kind of like mock flashing on a garden shed. And I thought, okay, that looks like funky and folksy and like something my grandparents would have done. So since I often use number 10 cans uh, because we're a big family, I just saved them and I used them and I really like that. Um, it's a little, you know, wabi-sabi. It's reusing something. And it actually works quite well as flashing and, and it sends the water kind of up and off the side of the coop so it doesn't go straight down the siding. That's a free scrounged window. One of the neighbor boys punched out part of the glass a decade ago. And I found that I um, actually I didn't need to put the glass back in. I just put some hardware cloth over it. And ooh, I have muddy hands from holding a chicken. So with any poultry housing, uh, having a really tightly sealed 
living enclosure is the kiss of death for your birds. It's a bad idea. Most folks think I need to seal everything up really, really well so that there are no drafts. Nope, your birds can handle a draft, I promise you. What they need is ventilation and good air circulation in the coop. And that means you do not want a tightly sealed coop. You want one that has good airflow because a tightly sealed coop equals fungal issues and birds have a really complicated respiratory system. They have their lungs and they have their air sacs and they can be really prone to things like aspergillus infections. And so we wanna make sure that we don't have a sealed up coop that traps moisture, we have good airflow. So I found that I didn't really need to put that little piece of glass back. I just used a piece of hardware cloth. As with everything, we try and use free scrounged materials whenever possible. All of our fencing, except for the cattle panel arches under which I'm standing, our free fencing we have scrounged off, scrounged off of Craigslist and or found on the side of the road. I believe that permaculture should be uh, reproducible for everybody, no matter your financial situation. Yes, it's wonderful to have your garden look like something out of the pages of Southern Living or Sunset Magazine, but the reality is, is that permaculture is about sustainable and reproducible living. So if it's gonna be sustainable, it has to be budget friendly, has to be accessible for everybody. Everybody has to be able to tap into permaculture. And so because we feel that that is in alignment with our, our ethics of um, share the surplus and are in alignment with our ethics of people care and earth care, we try whenever possible to use free stuff. Also, because we're on a really tight budget. I don't have extra money for fancy bougie garden crap. I have money for uh, necessities and if I can keep something out of the waste stream and use it in my garden in a purposeful and effective way, I'm going to do that rather than spend money on something new. So it means some elements of our garden are a little shabbier and maybe a little mismatched, a little wabi-sabi, but that's okay with me. So standing back here, looking at the chicken coop, again, you can see it's quite tall. There is my Illinois Everbearing Mulberry behind it. And the reason that uh, I put this mulberry behind it, which is probably too big for the space, and I'm thinking about removing it and putting something else, but for now it works really well, is that this mulberry shades my coop really well in the summer. And that means my girls have lots of shade. Poultry prefer the understory. Chickens are jungle fowl. They don't like to be in open pasture. They feel more secure under the cover of shrubs and trees. So I put them in with my orchard. You can see that the coop is incorporated into the fencing, use the wall of the coop as part of my fencing, and then I don't have to use as much overall fence. I have my cattle panel arch here. I moved my strawberry fields rows. I moved it from the side of the coop to go over this panel here. I just want to add some beauty to give my neighbors a more attractive view down here at the chicken coop. Um, and also, I just really love roses and I love the way that they add that kind of uh, cottage garden whimsy. Obviously, I like whimsy. So um, in front of it here, I have a, a plum but along the chicken coop, and this is one of the reasons I think having a big honking coop, if you have the space for it, is a great idea. I grow my Concord grape. Yes, it's a mess. Please do not judge my pruning. I did not get around to finishing pruning it um, in a timely manner this year, and that is okay. It will produce a lot of grapes. We can stack functions in permaculture and have one object do many jobs. So my coop is housing for my chickens. It is part of my fencing. It is a structure upon which I can grow grapes. And then in turn, my grapes scramble all along the fence here and up and over the chicken coop and additionally shade and cool my coop in the summer. So I'm really stacking those functions in together and that works really, really well for me. Usually my grapes go, it's hard to see through everything that's flowering, my grapes go all the way down this fencing here and that's totally fine. It shades all back here for my ducks and chickens to have that cooling effect in the summer. If we look over here, I have the edge of the coop. Again, not the most ideal roofing. It doesn't even match, but you know what? Free or repurposed, that's how it is here. I have an awning here. If you have chickens in the Pacific Northwest, I'm telling you right now, they need an awning. They do not like to stand out in the rain. It's not good for their feet. It's not good for their overall morale. So give them a place they can still be outside and not have to go all the way into the coop, but they can have protection from the rain. That's really important. So one of the other things I love about having a big tall coop is that I can stand up inside for cleaning it out. We keep a paint scraper on a nail on the wall inside the main door. And that means I can stand up and scrape all the poop off down onto the floor. We use the deep bedding method, which means that routinely about once a week, we come around, we scrape off all the poop, let it fall to the floor. We throw green material on the ground. Um, 
or maybe a brown material on the ground. So either that high nitrogen or high carbon, and we effectively make compost in the chicken coop itself. And then a few times a year, we shovel it all out and I put it around the garden. So the deep bedding method is one that you can read about. A lot of people use it. It's really effective. I think Joel Salatin called it the carboniferous diaper. Um, it is basically adding those layers of carbon in between the really rich nitrogenous waste of your um, chickens, absorbing the odor and allowing it to compost in place. We've used everything from coffee chaff to shredded office paper to weeds from the garden to raspberry prunings. I particularly like raspberry prunings around this corner on the ground in my chicken coop because I have a couple of hens who have a proclivity for laying on the floor in this corner. And if I stack up raspberry prunings there, then uh, they don't lay there anymore and they lay in the nest box. Folks have asked me whether that increases the risk of bumblefoot. I have not had a chicken have bumblefoot in 10 years. We had um, two chickens that were kind of prone to it and I think certain breeds can be prone to it. I have noticed salmon favorels can be kind of prone to it. And in general, other than my Brahma, I've stopped keeping chickens that have um, feathers on their feet, particularly in our muddy climate. I think that um, that traps moisture and bacteria up against their feet and is not a good scene. But in general, we've not really had bumblefoot issues. I have found the chickens don't go to nest on the raspberry prunings. They avoid them. So I don't have that uh, as a bumblefoot problem for those of you that have asked in the past. So again, this is the egg door. It's down low so children can reach it. And there is a set of roofs up above. Now, when we originally put in the coop, we had a really large door here from the previous owner. And there were a series of nest boxes along here. And what we found is the chickens all pretty much lay in one nest box. They're like, this is, this is the prime real estate. We're all gonna compete. And they will stand in line and they will balk and balk and balk and they'll wait for their turn to lay in this nest box. Okay, so here is our, our door to our nest box. And by nest box, I really mean a shelf. Um, there is a little lip on the front so the chickens can't push the eggs off onto the floor accidentally because chickens are, you know, if there's some way they can mess something up, they will. And I don't want those broken eggs attracting them to um, start eating eggs. So I actually have a board in the front, a little lip, and then the shelf slopes down and the eggs kind of roll toward me, toward the door. And that makes it easy for me to collect. So this is the back side of the coop. We are standing right here against my fence and this is my mulberry tree. And this is the door situation here. So we have a large door where we can open it and go inside. Now, right now you can see we just mucked out the coop and the deep bedding method means that we are using, I'm gonna flip this around. This is the large door. We're looking at the side of the coop. Again, we just used like seconds siding. So there's all kinds of flaws in it. It's okay, it's the backside. And we just have some scrounged siding here. And this is our system for opening this big door. And you can see here, it's just made out of old repurposed stuff we had lying around. And inside you can see the bedding of the coop. I am pretty clean, so I'm not gonna go in here right now. We just finished mucking it out and then put down a little bit of um, shredded office paper. And what we're gonna be doing here is again, stacking up those layers, letting the chickens really get in here and work it around, scratch in here. Sometimes I'll throw treats in here to encourage them to scratch. And it will be that kind of internal composting system right inside the coop. And I found that for me, um, it works really well to just use whatever brown or green material I have on hand and throw it down in there for that deep bedding method. And then eventually it gets all shoveled out and we use it in the garden. So some final thoughts on why I like having a big honkin' chicken coop, why I like keeping chickens in a permaculture system. Obviously eggs. Eggs are ridiculously expensive right now as the cost of groceries is going up and up and up and commercial feed and fertilizer is getting more and more expensive. That means everything that is produced in the industrial agriculture system is more expensive. My chickens eat food scraps. They eat um, things that I grow for them in the garden. Someone asked me recently about what I grow for my chickens and ducks and I'm going to be making a video on that because I try and source a lot of their food for free. We buy very little feed. We do have to buy some, particularly when we are raising chicks and ducklings. And we're going to be having turkeys next week, um, which 
I'm a little nervous about. But so um, for me, this system works um, really well because I spend very, very little money. I let them free range. They eat a lot of grubs and bugs and weeds in the garden. They get the run of the orchard in a uh, three paddock rotational system. And that means they have areas that are f fallow for a while and kind of regenerate and repopulate with seeds and bugs, turn them in there, they eat it. So I spend very, very little on feed. I get a yield of eggs. I get a yield of nitrogen rich manure that I use in my garden so that I have um, sufficient fertility in my annual veggie beds because most annual annual veggies are heavy feeders and that works really well for me. It's not perfect. Chickens scratch, they mess up things. It's really hard to have a chicken run that looks pretty. If you see um, magazine articles, in fact our chicken coop was featured in a magazine a while many years ago. Um, I had to throw down fresh hay right before and straw right before they came and did the photo shoot because the reality is it doesn't look like that most of the time. Chickens are a huge force for disturbance and they will take everything but back down to the bare soil as quickly as they can through their scratching and pecking. It's really hard to have a lovely looking chicken run. And if aesthetics are an issue, it's definitely something to consider in your garden. Um, but for me overall, I think it's really, really worth it. I really love having my chickens. I think the chicken coop is a great feature in my garden because it serves so many purposes. And it's such a great focal point at the back of my garden over which I have those beautiful Concord grapes scrambling. So thank you for watching today. Um, if you have more questions on poultry, I'm happy to answer them. We've been keeping poultry now for 13 years. And I know folks frequently ask me, how, how does this work? Can you talk more about your chickens in your system? Can you talk more about what works, what doesn't, and I'm gonna try and cover a little bit more of that. I wanna tag on here at the end of this video, I have recommended this book several times. If you have not read The Resilient Gardener by Carol Depp, it is a fabulous book about keeping poultry, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, particularly about sourcing as much of your own food for them as you can, and particularly about why they are a good ideal in a perma idea in a permaculture system. So check out The Resilient Gardener by Carol Depp, a fabulous, fabulous book. I will be back soon please check out also my Patreon down in the description for how you can support this channel. Thanks.